Look, stop running away from sin. Stop it. Just stop it. Stop trying to avoid sin. Pursue righteousness. Uh, you thought I was going somewhere else with that. Yes, pursue righteousness. Look, we've been doing a series on defining sin, and sometimes it's helpful in defining a concept to look at its contrast, righteousness. In this lesson, I want to answer a few questions, which is what is the opposite of being sinful? Is the Torah, the law, considered righteous? Can we actually be considered righteous by God? If so, how? What about those who don't know Yahweh's Torah, his law, his commands? In pursuit of righteousness, what questions should we start asking instead? First John 3 starts off saying, Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteousness. I wonder why he said, let no one deceive you. I think it's easy for someone to suggest that they are righteous, but don't actually practice what is right. So in this study, we're going to talk about what is right. No, really, not what someone else says, not what this minister, church or other people, social media. What is righteousness according to the true standard? Yahweh and his word, the word of God. He who practices righteousness is righteous. Do you want to be righteous? Well, stay tuned. And we're going to talk about what that looks like and how we can be, if it's possible, to be righteous. As we can see already from the last uh, verse, it is possible. Of course, John is not going to suggest us doing something that is not possible. So, but let's break down the word righteous. I always like to look at the definition and we're looking at here in the, in the enhanced uh, lexicon. The Greek in uh, lexicon, it says righteousness. We see the word Sadiq from 6663, which is we go. Basically, the root is this word um, saw doc, which literally means to be just be righteousness. And I wanted to show that because it doesn't get that much more complicated. When I first um, embarked on this study of righteousness, such a huge concept, such an important idea. I thought I was going to get into the weeds of something that was very complicated, but righteousness is simply that doing what's right. Now, the real question is, what do you mean? What's right? There's so many people and so many ideas of uh, politically correctness about what is actually right and what's wrong. Now, hopefully we established that from the last study about what is sin, but we're going to dive more into there to understand how do we decide on what is right? I'm going to make it easy for you. Well, not me, but the word of God has made it simple for us. Why? Because it says his Torah is righteousness. Let's look at some scriptures in Psalms 119, 172. It says, my tongue sings of your word for all your commandments are what? Righteousness. Ah, there we go. If you are subscribing to the word of God as your truth standard, we can settle here and say, finally, we know what's true because God's word said it's true. His commandments are righteous. But we go on another 119, 123. My eyes have pined away for your deliverance and for the word of your what? Of your righteousness. 119, 160. The sum of your word is truth and all of your righteousness. Right rulings are forever. The sum of all your word. If we put all of his word together, it's true. You know, what's good about truth is it's solid and unmoving. If you followed anything in our culture in popular culture and history, things are constantly shifting and changing, even with the scientists discoveries and what they said. And, you know, the they said this and they said that it's constantly shifting and changing. I'm so happy that he's given us a word that is hit the bedrock bottom. We can put our anchor as a, a resting place on his word, because it will not change. Since the beginning of time, his word is true. His word leads us and is righteousness. So as we talk about sin, looking at the other side of this coin, we want to examine righteousness, because that's really where we want to focus. Righteous seekers keep his commands. Now that we know what righteousness is, his word, word of his word, 
the things that he speaks, the commandments that he gives, his Torah, we can understand now how we can be connected to that righteousness. See, remember, first John said, don't be deceived. Those who uh, uh, are righteous are considered righteous. Those who do righteousness are considered right. So what does it mean to do righteousness? It literally means now from what we just saw, obey his commands, do what he's saying. And first John two, three, we go back to uh, first John again. It says, we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar. And the truth is not in that person. Okay, that's hot right there. That'll get some people in trouble. That'll get me in trouble just reading that, right? Because the word of God is creating a truth standard so clear and strong that it separates and divides those from who are truth, uh, uh, truthful and those who are liars. It clearly says that anyone, whoever says I know him, but does not do his commands. And there's a lot of religious people out there. I've been one of them and I'm uh, making every effort not to be someone who's simply a hypocrite who's saying, I know God, I trust him with my life. I give him all. I'm singing all the songs. Hallelujah. Praise Yahweh. Praise the Lord. You are my savior. You are my rock and my salvation. My, I, I don't want to just say those things. I want to make sure that my life is in tandem with that. He said, because anyone who's saying that in his life is not, in sync to that is a liar. And the truth is not in that person. But if, in verse five, but if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him. As if you didn't get the point already. Whoever claims to live in him must live as Yeshua did. Whoever claims, see, just because someone makes a claim to be a Christian, a claim to be a believer, a claim to be a follower. Yeah, I'm getting there. I'm going there because no one, I've done a lot of Bible studies, had a lot of conversations. No one likes their salvation and their relationship with God to be questioned. You cannot question me. And I think that's one of the biggest tricks of the devil because it gets us into a, 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 a false sense of security that we don't ever want to examine as Paul calls us to examine, examine, Test your faith. Whoever claims there's claims that are being made in this moment, in this day that are not true. And because we are afraid of hurting someone's feelings based on this idea of relative truth, you have your truth. You have everybody feels like, no, no, no. According to his word is clear. If they are not walking in obedience to his commandments, the truth is not in them. And this is not righteousness. Obedience to Yahweh's commandments is righteousness, as we discuss. Deuteronomy says it again, then it would be righteousness for us if we are careful to observe all these commandments before Yahweh our God, as he has commanded us. It can't be stated any more clear. Then it would be righteousness for us if we're careful to obey, to observe all these commandments. See, before they enter the promised land, Moses had reminded them of God's instruction, his Torah, what he expected of them. He says, if you want to be righteous, follow that. Surrender to that. Let's look at some examples of righteousness, an example of people who have been righteous. I think this is important because it's easy to dismiss this idea to something uh, of a unicorn that doesn't really happen to just God and Yeshua. Or as some people say Jesus, and that's just them. We're not really expected to do that. So we use I phrases like we all are human to excuse sin that we know we shouldn't be committing where we're human and we continue to walk in that sin. But God says it doesn't have to be that way. And let's look at some examples where we see that Noah was righteous because he followed Yahweh's Torah. God gave him the label and name of righteous. You know, I, I think, um, how would you like to be called righteous by God himself? And this is what Noah gets. Why? Well, let's look at some reasons why. Galatians 6 and 9 says, this is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was just, there is that word again. He was righteous. He was a righteous, he was a just man. That's possible? Yep. Do you want your name there? 
this was a just woman. This was a just man. That's possible to be righteous before God's eyes in scripture. Perfect in his generations. What? Noah walked with God. Ah, see, you can't divorce those two. The idea of being righteous and walking with God means walking in surrender and obedience to his commandments. Now, you may not know all the commandments and all these things, and I don't want to um, put that on anyone. But I've learned that simply asking someone, is there something right now in this season of your life you know you should be doing, but you're not doing? Do that. For some, it may mean opening up the scriptures. For others, it, means, it may mean extending forgiveness. For others, it may mean reaching out and sharing their faith more often, going to church, uh, praying more. I don't. It's a litany of things that he's put on your spirit. You just know. And you grow and mature in that. But if you're saying all kinds of excuses for why you don't want to or can't or that's not righteousness. Don't be deceived. One who claim but will not obey the commandments. Genesis 26, 22, thus Noah did according to all that God commanded him. So he did. It's that simple. He did what he was commanded. Noah was righteous because God He followed his Torah. And these are two more scriptures. You shall take with you, you know, when he was putting all the animals together. You shall take with you seven of each, every clean animal, a male, his female, two of animal, two of each animals that are unclean, a male and his female. Also seven, each of the birds of the air, male and female, to keep the species alive on the face of the earth. And Noah did according to all that Yahweh commanded him. You see that word all keep coming up? It comes up a lot. Um, it comes up earlier or later with Moses as well when they're instructed to build a tabernacle. Or the, uh, the, 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 yeah, the tabernacle. They did all. Not some, not most, and not more. Because those are the kind of justifications we give for why we believe we are following God with all our hearts. While we are righteous. While we are right with God, we say I've done more than I used to or more than others. I've done uh, uh, um, in comparison to what I used to do. I've done uh, most of what he's told me. But he told the rich man there was one thing and that kept him from truly following him. He says, sell all your possessions. Come follow me. It doesn't matter that we have 90 percent we can offer. Yeshua is looking for Yahweh is looking for full commitment. Genesis 7, 1, it says, then Yahweh said to Noah, come into the ark, you and all your household. Why? Because I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. Amongst a generation that was filled with wickedness and unrighteousness, unrighteousness, Yahweh was able to select a man that says you are righteous before me. Can you imagine the reputation he had in that community as being awkward, weird, strange, unnecessary? I'm just saying that he probably wasn't always popular because he was so different. I'm speaking to someone who is trying or making a decision to follow God, but afraid of the pushback, afraid of what people are going to say. So I'm going to go ahead and say you're going to get that. Yeshua says no student is greater than his master. You're going to get that if they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. But know that when you get this encouraging words from your father in heaven. That says, I have seen that you are righteous. Just you and God are the majority. It doesn't matter this popularity contest of everybody's doing that. Everybody's talking like this, buying this, dressing like this pursuing these things. This is common. This is normal. This is PC, politically correct. God don't care. He's looking at his standard. If you want to be righteous, it means separating yourself, which is connected to this idea of holiness, coming out from them and being holy. Abraham was righteous. Why? Same reason. He did what was commanded. Then he brought him outside and said, look now toward heaven. Count the stars if you're able to number them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. And he believed in Yahweh and he accounted it for righteousness because he believed. He was in the spirit and attitude that Yahweh called him to be. He said, this is what's going to happen. And by faith, he says, I, I received that. 
and just in that moment, without him getting up and physically doing anything, righteous, righteousness. What are you being called to right now to show up in righteousness? Just in standing on his promises and saying, I believe that that is true. Not worrying, not pulling your hair out, not anxiety. Anywhere there's anxiety, there's not that trust. But saying, no, no, no. This is a difficult moment in my life personally, in my family, in my job, in the country, in the world, whatever it is. But you can say, I trust your word and I can stand on that. And he says, it accounted for righteousness toward him. I would love to have that. Again, then Yahweh said, shall I hide? You know, when he was about to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, talking to the angels that were sent about Abraham, he says, then Yahweh says, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation and all nations on earth will be blessed through him. For I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him. See, he wanted to make sure that this father was going to be spreading this message to his children, that they keep the way of Yahweh to do righteousness. It's all equivalent. Keeping the way of Yahweh is doing righteousness. So we don't want to just run from sin. Matter of fact, that shouldn't be the focus. We want to pursue righteousness, righteousness and justice that Yahweh may bring to Abraham what he has spoken. Now, I feel a need to make this point. Works won't say it because I know someone listening to this right now is thinking, are you telling me that works are going to save me? Now, I know Paul talks about works don't save and this and that. This is not what this is saying. That's why I wanted to make sure I inundate us with scripture where Yahweh is saying these people are deemed righteous. It wasn't some person who came up with this idea. So if you want to get into Yahweh's, uh, into your heavenly father's graces and, hit, and hear those words from him, you're going to obey his commands to be in that righteousness. This person is not seeking it to save themselves. Of course, there's nothing we can do to save ourselves. Titus tells us that. But when the kindness of the love of God, our Savior toward men appeared, not by works of righteousness, which, are, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. I just got to say that because some some of us, we, we go down that road and well, we can't be saved by what we do. And oftentimes I've heard it as an excuse to continue sinning, to continue just saying, well, I'm human and we make mistakes and. That's not the heart and attitude at all. God can't be mocked. He says, be righteous. Walk in what's just and right. Not in a sense of I'm saving myself. The only reason that this gets us into righteousness is because God created it. We didn't make this up. We're just being submissive and obedient to what he put out there. We're not saving ourselves. I'm just submitting. But we want to do it because of how grateful we are for the opportunity. First things first. First things first. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. You notice that it said what to seek and what not and, and not what not to seek. It, Yeshua did not say run away from evil, avoid sin. While he does speak to that, that is not the focus we should be living every day with. We should not be waking up thinking about what sin can I avoid now? What can I get away from? Because anyone who's lived long enough knows that where your focus goes, your energy flows. <laughs> if you're focused on not hitting that curve, you're probably going to hit it. If you're focused on not making the mistake, you're probably going to. You know, if you ever got up in the middle of the night trying to be quiet, focused on trying not to make a noise and you hit that uh, control or bump into a wall, it's just how it is. Your focus should not be on avoiding sin. It should be on seeking his righteousness. So when it comes to seeking righteousness, don't seek what's wrong with, right? Don't start asking questions like, hey, what's wrong with going to a club? What's wrong with watching this show? What's wrong with listening to this music? What's, he says, no, 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 no. You're seeking the wrong stuff. What's wrong with dressing like this? What's wrong with having, what? No, no, no. The, 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 the imperative was seek his righteousness. Instead, Shouldn't we be asking what's right 
with going to the club? What's right with this outfit? What's right with this job I'm choosing? What's right with this partner I've chosen to be with? What's right about, because I'm seeking his righteousness. That's the question. I'm going to tell you something. Asking that question is going to make everything so much clearer. When you stop living in the shade and the shadiness and the grayness of what's wrong with the tiptoe in the line, you're already off. He says, seek my righteousness. If you are serious about getting rid of sin, turn your back on it completely and pursue righteousness. Okay, what about those who don't know Yahweh's instruction when it comes to righteousness and sin? This question always comes up. And I I don't know um, why it comes up for each person, but I imagine sometimes it's wondering, maybe for me, right? Because sometimes we're asking for a friend, but kind of wondering for us, what if I don't know? What if, what about those people? So let's share a couple of scriptures about what if someone doesn't know this commandments? How can they be righteous? Is that possible? First, I will share that it's really hard because God has made it so evident. Okay. Now, I know we're talking about something. We're thinking about third and fourth, fifth world countries and what. Let's just slow down. God has made it so evident. Let's look at a scripture in uh, Romans that Paul goes into about this topic. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who what suppress the truth in unrighteousness. So the wrath is being revealed. Wrath is a pretty bad place. This is the anger and the damnation that comes from God. You don't want to be caught up in that. But why? Because they're suppressing the truth in unrighteousness. By living in that state, they're suppressing. To suppress the truth means there's an understanding that is there. I'm just pushing it down. When we suppress bad memories, we push those down so far that they almost don't exist. Because what may be known about God is manifest in them. For God has shown it to them. Now, I don't know how he does it with every person. I've never been in any other skin than this one, so I can't speak to that, nor will I try. But again, I stand on the scripture and I see that God has shown it to them. Matter of fact, if you saw the last study, what is sin or I'm sorry, seeking God, seeking and finding God. We talked about in Acts 17 how God has has um, chosen the places where each man should live so that they may seek him, reach out for him and find him. I'm standing on that. I don't know how he does it. They may not have the knowledge and understanding I have. But he says, I've set it up so that each man may seek me, reach out for me and find me. So in this, we start to see the truth has been made evident. Even going back to the creation of the world, he says, since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, clearly seen. Why? Being understood by the by by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. I can see someone raising their hand. I got an excuse. I didn't know. I didn't no excuse because God has set everyone up in such a way. I appointed the times and places, even through my nature, even through my my invisible attributes have been made clear. Because although they knew God, They did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and the birds and four footed animals and creeping things. Therefore, God also gave them up in their uncleanness and the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves who exchanged the truth of God for the lie. There was an exchange that happened. Many who may profess that I don't believe in God, I don't know God, I don't want to know God, has made an exchange that we will never know about, but they and God know very clearly. And worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who was blessed forever. Amen. See, this is not just creatures anymore. I'm coming out with a study about idolatry today. And what that looks like. We've exchanged the glory of God for all kinds of things and peoples and ideas and systems and processes to replace him. 
And lastly, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual morality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil mindedness. They are whisperers. And this is the con concept of like gossipers. He says they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. I don't like this. For whatever reason, it doesn't vibe with my experience in life. And I don't I don't like to have to be submissive and obedient to anything. Or I don't agree. And we start putting ourselves in judgment of God. Well, I think that's wrong. I've been in Bible studies while we read scriptures and people have gotten upset at what they heard and started saying that's wrong. I'm like, hold on. Do you understand what you're saying? You're exchanging God for you and sitting in his place. And so you can be a judge over that. He says, no, you know the truth. I've made that apparent. Also, there's another group who simply needs to be faithful with what they've been given. In Luke 12, 47, it says in that servant who knew his master's will, he was telling the parable here. And there's a servant who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself to do according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. But he who did not know, look at this, see there's a difference here, yet committed things deserving of stripes, shall be beaten with few. Notice there's a difference, and this is Yeshua speaking, notice there's a different punishment, a different discipline for the one who knew the master's will and who didn't know. For everyone to whom much is given from him, much will be required and to whom much has been committed of him they will ask the more this is some of the most humbling uh scriptures for me as i grow in my knowledge and understanding of god i'm held accountable as i come to realize the gifts he's given me i'm held accountable he says i expect more from you in proportion to what you've been given in proportion to the the life that i've blessed you with you live in a country, you've been blessed with this parents, you have two hands, two legs, your mind. I'm holding you responsible for that. So what about those who don't know? Well, he holds them responsible for what they do have, the knowledge that they do have. So that's important to keep in mind. Now, the last category, what about those who are really blind? Like they literally don't know completely. And I think of babies when I think of this absolutely no knowledge have no clue and even us there's things right now all of us just don't know that we could be doing inadvertently and in the praise god he's made provisions for that and we saw that in the old testament and i have a study coming up after this one um, that's going to talk about intentional versus unintentional sin but those who are truly blind what about those john 9 when speaking about a blind man who was healed yeshua said to them if you were blind you would have no sin. But now you say we see. Therefore, your sin remains. See, when we claim we can actually see and we understand that I'm a follower, that I know his word. He says you're held accountable to that. John 15, if I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. There would be an excuse if there was true ignorance completely did not know. Reading on, it says, as it is, because I, I repeated that if it had no, if it had not done, if, if I had not done among them the works no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. As it is, they have seen and yet they have hated both me and my father. See, the problem is you have seen and you've hated both me and my father. And the way we hate is not necessarily in this attitude of I'm so angry and mad. We'll learn after reading the scriptures that hate comes through an attitude, but also through an action of, of not obe obeying. That's rebellious. Those who are truly blind, he says, I can't describe sin because you really don't know any better about this issue, about this topic. So, but we got to be careful here of intentional blindness. What do I mean intentional blindness? There's some there's some who are seeking to be intentionally blind. I don't want to know because they realize what we just read and don't want to be held accountable and say, well, if I don't know, you can't hold me accountable to it. I just want to remind you, you cannot mock God. Are you crazy? 
You're going to actually say, I know where to get truth. I know what I'm being nudged to do. There's something in this message right now that's staring me up. I'm just not going to do it. That's willful disobedience. So if you listen to this right now, you have some work to do. So that's not you. You are, you know, some of the things just from what we shared and you're likely being stirred to move deeper along that path. Second Timothy four, three, it says, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. There's a group of people. He says they're not going to put up a sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap for themselves teachers. They will heap up for themselves teachers and they will turn their ears away from truth, away from righteousness and be turned aside to fables, to lies, to rituals and all these things away from truth. They literally cover their ears. If you ever try to share with someone something that's absolutely true and they just absolutely refuse to hear it. Do not want to consider a logical argument and the basis. Nope, nope, nope. I've had many conversations with many people in, in, in different churches to discover that many are more emphatic and determined to hold on their tr- to, th- to their traditions than to truth. This is I've, this I'm, I'm quoting when I say this is how we've always done it and this is how we all, always do it. Some don't see it because they refuse to even listen. Others see it, but refuse to do otherwise because it's too disruptive. Some even use the term uh, dissensions. You're causing disruption. Well, when truth comes in, things need to be shaken up to disrupt it. The point of the, the, the primary focus should not be us all getting along. The primary focus should be all us connecting with truth through Yeshua, the Messiah. So be careful not to fall into that trap. I was saying I'm going to have willful blindness, intentionally cover my eyes, ears, so I don't I don't see and understand. I'm not going to open a word. I'm not going to attend that service. I'm not going to ask this person because I don't want to know. Instead, as Romans 12 says, we should be renewing our mind. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is right and good and acceptable and perfect and and, and perfect will of God. An acceptable and perfect will of God. Constantly be renewing. If you study biology and you know about our cells, our cells and all the cells of our body are constantly being renewed and refreshed. If we didn't, we'd be dying. We have to stay fresh. There are going to be ideas that come up to us that are new, but that's okay. It's going to challenge us to grow. That's what growth is. If you're not growing, you're dying. So renew your mind. Um, Let iron sharpen iron. Closing with this passage, even though we know the answer, is it possible to be considered righteous? I go to Luke chapter one, verse five. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judah, a certain priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah. His wife was of the daughters of Aaron and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God. Isn't that beautiful? These just seem like just normal people. We looked at Abraham. We looked at uh, Noah. We could look at Yeshua and so many, Job and so many. These guys weren't of any special nobility or of any. But this couple, these two, were considered righteous. I don't care what title any job gave you. The, the title of righteous by, from, from God's mouth, in his word, is hands down the best. How, why were they deemed righteous? Well, you see it there. Walking in all the commandments and ordinances of Yahweh, blameless. And I want to continue to highlight what commandments. There is no New Testament at this point. It was only what we considered the Old Testament. They were faithful to those 10 commandments. They were faithful to the commandments as they were laid out. Otherwise, are we going to be so? Do we are we so concerned with righteousness? that we too are going to adhere and study differently and deeply his word so that we can be called righteous. All right. Summary. Righteousness is the opposite of being sinful. Yahweh's instructions or Torah, they're righteous. The scriptures say so. It's a solid bedrock for us. We can be considered righteous by obeying those instructions. 
when you open up your scripture, stop, stop. If this is you, because this used to be me for so many, for most of my religious life, I felt like this was me. I would see passages and kind of do them and agree that this is true. This is a good idea. But to fully decide that that's what I'm going to do and it's wrong to do otherwise. uh, Change the attitude. We are held accountable for what we know of Yahweh's Torah. And you know a lot. You know a lot more than you probably realize or want to admit. 